Welcome, Bhante. It is really a pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to have this interview with you today. Thank you. And let me begin by introducing uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Bhante Vimala Ramsey is a Mahathira monk. He has been a monk for more than 35 years. Yeah. And uh, he's currently the abbot of Tamasuka Meditation Center. And he is one of the monks that I have met whose teachings are based on the earliest and most comprehensively recorded teachings of Buddha, uh, straight from the suttas, as he says. And uh, why it's a very special moment for me is because for a brief period, I had the opportunity to have a temporary ordination as a Samanera monk while at the uh, Damasuka Meditation Center with uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. So, Bhante, very welcome once again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. Welcome back to the part two of our conversation with Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Uh, Bhante, welcome back from the break. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so the second part of the conversation, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into the teachings uh, of Dhamma and, uh, and the words of Buddha. There is this, uh, there are many uh, styles of meditation that are taught around the world. Very often I have uh, students that come to me who relate to meditation and the concentration, absorption meditation. And you are one of the foremost, I would say, in some sense, a unique North Star in that area who has gone back to the original suttas and has actually bridged the understanding to what was really meant and how different it is from concentration as it's understood. I would love for you to share some of that uh, wisdom with our listeners. Okay. One-pointed concentration or absorption concentration is this. Your mind is on an object of meditation. I don't care what that object is. It can be the breath. It can be loving kindness. It can be staring at a candle. It can be anything. Now, your mind gets distracted. You have a thought that pulls your attention away. One-pointed concentration or absorption concentration is this. You see that your mind is not with your object of meditation. And immediately you drop the thought or the feeling, whatever it happens to be, that distracted you and come back to your object of meditation. Now, what happens is you do that enough that you're going to start staying on your object of meditation. Absolutely. And your, your sense of concentration is going to get so deep that it suppresses the hindrances. It stops hindrances from coming up. So you don't have distractions. Now, what that means also is that your mind will start to get into a state of bliss where it's very peaceful and very uh, at ease. And you stay there for a period of time and you think, this is it. <laughs> this is really the best meditation I've ever Everything. run across. Yeah, true. I'm quiet, I'm peaceful. Yeah. But when you break your sitting and you're not in that deep state of concentration, you still have the same kind of problems that you had before you started. You still have the anger, the dissatisfaction, the sadness. And then you want to run back into that state because <laughs> it was so peaceful. And that's what's happening with yeah. almost everybody right. that's doing meditation. Yeah, a lot of people like that. They're, they're suppressing the hindrances and they just want to feel good. <laughs> now, when you're practicing what I teach, your mind is on your object of meditation, that's the same. Your mind gets distracted, that's the same. Now, here is what the difference is. Now, you let that distraction be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on it. You don't push it away. You don't try to force it away. You just don't keep your attention on it anymore and relax that tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. 
and bring up something wholesome, smile, and bring that smiling, happy mind that's pure and clear back to your object of meditation. So with one-pointed concentration, you don't recognize the craving, and you're bringing craving back to your object of meditation, and that causes the concentration to get deeper and, and deeper. deeper. And it stops the hindrances from arising while you're in that state. When you're practicing the way that I'm teaching you, you recognize hindrances when they come up and you allow them to be there by themselves and relax. You let go of the craving. So right now you've purified your mind. When you don't let go of craving, then you're going to keep that craving and not be able to recognize, recognize it. Yeah, absolutely. So true. And I know that there are some people that say, there's only one kind of jhana. <laughs> now, yeah, there, there jhana, is. There is jhana yeah. is a word that's very much misunderstood. Understood. Yeah, true. Jhana means a level of your understanding, a level of your being able to see and teach yourself how to let go of craving. Almost everybody that teaches uh, absorption meditation, they say, jhana means concentration. <laughs> Now, this is a word that I don't use very often yeah. because it's so misunderstood. Yeah. You see somebody that's playing baseball and they get a close-up of the guy's eyes and he's ready to hit the ball, and they say, look at that concentration. <laughs> yeah. Now, he's not distracted at all. He's, yeah. he, he sees how all of these different parts of the ball moving towards him yeah. and how to adjust, and that's concentration but it's not letting go of the craving. Yep. One of the things is when you recognize the letting go of craving, you become more efficient with whatever you're doing because you'll be able to recognize the hindrances when they come up and pull you away. I taught uh, a lot of college students and they have a big test coming at the end of the year and they're all excited and they're all dreading that uh, that test and I ask them when you're studying does your mind get pulled away do you start worrying about whether you're going to do well on the test or not well yeah all the time why? Why are you worrying about something that hasn't even happened, happened yet? yet. Yeah. Why don't you recognize it, let it be there by yourself, by itself, take a breath, and come back, and laugh with yourself for getting pulled away? When you do that, all of a sudden your mind starts staying on what you're reading, and you don't have to go over it again and again and again because you got distracted. distracted yeah. So you become more efficient with what you're doing while you're doing it. Okay. And that makes life more fun. Oh, it does. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's why you call your technique of meditation as tranquil wisdom inside yeah. uh, meditation. And uh, you know, before I had the opportunity to... Uh, study with uh, with Bhante Vimalaramsi, I had also practiced a different form of concentration meditation as one of the techniques I was trained in. And I, and I know exactly what you, what you said about fighting your mind with mind, using your yeah. mind to suppress the mind. It, it can lead you to sometimes literally have a headache. Uh, yeah, it can le after it. lead you to the crazy, crazy house too. Absolutely, absolutely. And so TWIM is actually a very wonderful technique uh, that uh, Bhante Vimla Ramsey has been teaching for, for quite a while now and leading retreats. 
has trained retreat leaders who are now going out and teaching, and some of them are my good personal friends. I've had the pleasure to come to know them through, uh, through Bhante. And there's a very nice book, so we will talk about the book towards the end of it, in which uh, Bhante talks about the twin technique. Bhante, now, in this subject, uh, with your permission, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into aspects of, as much as you clarified in the first part, that Buddhism is not a religion, right? However, any organized practice, people need to put a label to it, right? And uh, and some people will always think of it as a religion. Yeah. And what, what that will bring up, not necessarily in a bad way, you know, I mean, uh, religion doesn't mean we have to defend it. And uh, the uh, I would like to draw some attention to some concepts that people who are not familiar with Eastern faiths, per se, tend to have a challenge understanding what they really mean. And I, I can imagine you can guess what I'm going to ask you about. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about the Buddhist principle of rebirth, right? Because in, the, in most Abrahamic religions, as practiced, uh, um, uh, as practiced by common people, uh, the concept of reincarnation and, or rebirth, and I understand they're different. Yeah. So would you like to say a little bit about what the Buddhist concept of rebirth is and how it differentiates from the Hindu concept of reincarnation? Yeah. And this is something that if you practice meditation, you will be able to see this for yourself. If you're practicing with the six arts. Six arts, absolutely. Rebirth. Uh, a lot of people, I know that there's uh, uh, some big teachers that they don't, I don't believe in rebirth. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what you did when you were 10 years old. <laughs> Are you the same person now? No. Yeah. So that means you're reborn, right? Yeah. Reincarnation is something that the Dalai Lama is into. And, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to die from this this existence and be reborn as a human being and carry on with things like that. And that is a very superficial way of looking at things. Now, I teach you in meditation how to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Right. Yep. Now, that was roughly a hundred thousand arising and passing Present. away of sound consciousness. Yes. When you see me talking and you hear me talking, you think that's happening at the same time. One of the principles of Buddhism is that things only happen one thing at a time. <laughs> so when you're hearing me, you're not seeing me, although it's happening so fast that you think it is. You think this is the way it is. I teach meditation to a degree where you will be able to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. And you'll see this for yourself. And this is called birth and death of one consciousness. And it happens very, very fast. Reincarnation implies the same consciousness goes from one body to the next, to the next, to the next. The way the Buddha teaches is that consciousnesses are continually arising and passing away. And there's birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, continually happening. That's why this is called rebirth not reincarnation. Yeah. Uh, the Buddha never taught reincarnation. Mm. I don't really understand how some Buddhists can think that there is. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do understand that 
when Buddhism became popular, it went from one country to another country to another country, and things got changed. Yeah. That's why it's important to go back to the, as close to the original teachings as you can go. Yeah. Now, mindfulness of breathing. A lot of people are doing the breath meditation. And they're told, put your attention on your nostril tip. <laughs> put your attention on your upper lip. Put your attention on your abdomen. Right. And focus on the breath. It doesn't say that in the instructions. No, it does not. Not in the sutta. It says you understand when you take a long breath, breath or short breath. short breath. Understand means that you know that your breath is long when it's long and when it's short. But it is short. When, it, when it's fast, when it's slow, you know all of these things. And knowing is observing. The next part of the instructions is on the in-breath, you tranquilize the body, or the, uh, you experience yes. the entire bodily That's formation. Yeah. Okay. Now, that means that you know what's happening in your body uh -huh. on the in-breath and on the out-breath. You use the breath as the reminder to relax that tension and tightness in your head and your mind. And that's what the next part of the instructions minute, say. Yeah. The instructions in mindfulness and breathing are very, very simple. Yeah. I practiced 20 years a method of mindfulness of breathing, watching the abdomen for 20 years, <laughs> and I still didn't understand what they were talking about with those instructions. So it's not focus on the breath, it's use the breath as the reminder to relax. Yeah. You relax on the in-breath, you relax on the out-breath. I teach loving-kindness meditation because I like to see people progress in meditation very fast. Loving-kindness is a way of wishing someone else happiness, happiness yeah. and feeling that happiness and radiating that happiness to them. And it's a meditation that you can take with you in your daily life. When you're walking from here to your car, what are you doing with your mind? Thinking this, thinking that. When you start practicing loving-kindness, you start radiating loving-kindness to all beings. You see some birds out there, wish them happiness. And it helps uplift your mind. Absolutely. And then you give it away. See, that comes back to what meditation actually it is. is. Yeah. The more you can smile during the day and wish somebody happiness, the more you're practicing your generosity. Yeah. And the happier you become. And then sometimes you'll be walking and you're not thinking about that and you'll walk by somebody and they, they smile at you. As, oh, thanks. Yeah. They help remind you, oh, this is what I want to be doing. <laughs> and it leads to a mind that's more gentle more balanced. The highest feeling that you can experience in the meditation is equanimity. Mm. And that means balance. Mm. Somebody could come at you with their, their anger and you don't take it as yours personally. You look at them and you wish them happiness. That takes their anger away. One of the things that the Buddha said is you can never overcome hatred by hatred. But how many times are we trying to do that, especially with the way politics in the world are, <laughs> is working right now? <laughs> Not a great day to talk about it today. <laughs> you just get people yelling at each other, each other and they're not listening to each other at all. Yeah, true. So, 
instead of doing that, wish them happiness. Yeah. Their mind calms down. I've seen it happen thousands of times. Yeah, yeah. And radiate loving kindness into the situation. Yeah. And when you do that, you become more focused in what you're doing. Yeah. You're more successful with what you're doing. And the people that you're working with become happy because you're giving them the example of being happy. happy. And that's what loving kindness yeah. is about. Yeah. Sometimes I like to say, you know, being loving, kind and happy is contagious. As contagious as being sad and complaining is. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to be, if you're going to contaminate people, contaminate them with joy yeah. and happiness. Uh, in the corporate world today, Vante, we work routinely with uh, corporate clients where there are deadlines and demands and pressures to perform. And, and uh, they all often approach us that uh, how might they integrate mindfulness into the workplace? How might leaders integrate mindfulness into their leadership style? So I wonder if you have some, I know you don't like calling them tips, but if you have some well, practices I, yeah, to share. Yeah, yeah. See, the thing that r almost nobody really understands is how easy it is to get distracted away from what you're doing while you're doing it. Absolutely. You're focusing on this and somebody comes and asks you a question. question. And, and then you have an emotional reaction to that. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't have done that. that. Why, yeah. do you, why are you bothering me now? Yeah. Okay, so when you're practicing equanimity, it's okay, yeah. and you become more efficient. You don't have thoughts. See, somebody comes up and they say something to you. You might not like it. They go away. What do you think about? <laughs> Why did you say you that to me? Are <laughs> you thinking about what you should be thinking about or what they just got through saying and how yeah. much you don't like it? Yeah. How much pain do you cause yourself because of that? Yeah. When you have good equanimity, when you have good balance of mind, it doesn't matter what somebody else says to you. They can have their opinion, fine. That doesn't mean you have to make it your opinion or your dislike of an opinion and fight with it. You have to change, or for that matter, change their opinion. You don't they have can, to change their opinion. They can keep it. They can keep their opinion. Yeah. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. But it's the balance of mind that strikes them. And they, they see that you can go back to work and, and not be distracted at all. And that impresses them. The way you become a teacher is by example. And the more you can be an example of balance and happiness, the more you affect everybody around you. And then everybody starts to become more efficient. So this practice is about life. It's not this practice and then I'm gonna go do this, or I'm gonna go think about this. No, you think about this, and don't let yourself be distracted. Yeah. Even if somebody comes up and they try to distract you, you can go back to it very easy because you're not making a big deal of the distraction. Yeah. No, that's very good. I, I, I completely agree. In fact, the, the pressure in the corporate world is so much about multitasking that, I mean, I've never, <laughs> I've never really understood how can you be doing more than one task at a time. Right. It's really bad. And, and you don't do any task That's very well. Very well, absolutely. When you're multitasking. Uh, absolutely. I have a student that got upset because she used to multitask all the time. <laughs> and she practiced with me and she said, now I can't multitask. Yeah. I have to do this and get it done and get it done right before I do something else. Yeah. And I said, yeah. And how much more efficient are you? You get more done during the day when you don't multitask. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, the, 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 the concept of multitasking, just a trivia, uh, comes from the world of computers. When first powerful computers were developed, they could do more than one task uh, at a time. That did not mean 
that at the same time they were doing ta two tasks. It just meant they were completing tasks faster so that they can do more tasks in less time. Yeah. It was actually a measure of efficiency and productivity. It wasn't a measure of how di distributed, uh, scattered the yeah. mind was. But the thing is, if you try multitasking, you might forget something. Yeah, yeah. And then you got to come back and, and do it. redo it again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are you being efficient by doing it that no, way? No, it's not. And that's that's the problem yeah. with retasking. Yeah, yeah. And people are not very good one when of the things, they're doing it that way. One of the things we try when we practice at IAM is called the touch once rule. Once you touch a task, you finish it, but you, so you don't have to touch it again. Right. So we call it the touch once rule. If you open this... You finish it and get out of it. The, the ability to focus when I was, uh, you know, in, in my study of psychology and human cognition, during the early 2000s, you could find 18 to 20 minutes of concentration, as in uh, the ability to stick to a task before you were disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the same study was repeated in 2012. It was down to eight minutes. Yeah. Now the average that's trending, and I was just reading uh, some research that came out uh, from from neuropsychologists now, uh, is that uh, it's down to two and a half minutes. Yeah, that yeah. every two and a half minutes, people need to to distract and do something different to get that dopamine shot. That that their sense of well-being is coming. Oh, I'm trying to do many things. So we call it, you know, v running. You know, being very busy in life, accomplishing nothing. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different productivity and activity. Yeah. But they also worked a lot in the prisons, yeah. teaching and, and in medium security prisons, you know, in, yeah. in tough prisons. And uh, would you like to share a little bit of, of that anecdote? Well, I, I, gave them a, I give them talks on the advantage of, of learning how to be happy and the advantages of not taking things personally. personally yeah. We finally set up uh, that we would come once a month and for one week I would give them a retreat. And it started at 8 o'clock in the morning, stopped at 8 o'clock at night. But the advantages of them learning how to use the six R's and how to not react all the time when somebody says something you don't like and then you fight with them, uh, then they learn that they can accept things without getting highly emotional. They started developing their equanimity. And it got so, at this one, one prison, that when prisoners get together, they yell. They're always making noise. It's never quiet. So they wanted to come and sit in meditation and it wasn't quiet so it was hard for them they finally convinced the warden to give them another building to be in where they could go in and sit and the guards were very much shocked by this and they would go in and sit in meditation with the prisoners and that was kind of a new concept for them for they'd, them. they'd never done that before and it's just a matter of being more aware of things that make you unhappy and letting that go. And the unhappy things are things that you've already made an opinion about, I don't like this, and then you beat yourself up because of that. And you wind up causing yourself more and more pain. Yeah. I got them to start smiling. And then the man would come in, their, their prisoner uh, guard, and they would see that they're happy and they're not causing any problems, and they would go in and just wreck the room and uh, throw all the stuff around and break stuff. And this one man, he was known for being angry, and he was thrown in the hole, the isolation, for at, at least a week per month. I mean, he, he was always getting in trouble. And after I taught him this, and I got him to start seeing the sense of it, right after a meditation class, 
he went back to his, his room and the guards came in and they tore his room up. And he didn't respond with anger. He just looked at him and he kind of smiled a little bit. And then as they were leaving, he said, thank you very much. You've given me a chance to clean out a lot of stuff. <laughs> and they didn't know how to handle it. And after, it was about a month, then they started letting him go out so he could be outside and work in the garden because he had changed his perspective and he changed the dislike that he had and taking it personally and causing himself, himself so much pain, he started seeing there's a different way and a different perspective that you can use. And I, I was there for about a year at this one uh, prison. And when I left, they were going through major changes because even the Muslims, who are very militant at times, were starting to come to the class for meditation and learning about how to let go of these painful feelings and painful actions. So they went through a major change in, in that prison just by a few people being an example of how to be happy and how to accept and how to not resist everything that happens to them. So the meditation becomes something that's very practical. It's not something that you have to pray to another God. To. Yeah, yeah. You don't pray to somebody else to help you overcome the problem. The essence of meditation, the essence of Buddhism is self-responsibility. Take care of yourself. The more happy you become, the more you affect people around you. Absolutely. And if you want to be happy in your place, wherever you live, you have to practice being happy. happy. And Absolutely. that's what meditation does. does. Well, Vanti, that was a fantastic finale to our conversation <laughs> because, well, not, uh, luckily, not a lot of the world is logged in prison, but almost everyone seems to be logged in the prison of modern life, of distraction and demands and the suffering that comes from it. Yeah. And you're teaching about how to make the circumstances of that transform by changing your perspective is a lesson that we can all learn and benefit from. And thank you once again, Bhante, for sharing that wisdom uh, with us. It is my greatest is pleasure to do that. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And we hope that we will see you again and we will have a chance to have more conversation okay. and with you. That would be good. Likewise.